in mind all along. That's the lesson that the text is supposed to teach us. There's a reason why we identify with those characters. Because here's the thing. As we're reading the text, if we enter into the emotion of it, if we enter into the drama of it, then it's shaping our affections the more and more we read it. Um, I've thought about this a lot in recent years, right? Like, um, oftentimes when I'm reading the Old Testament, I used to be really struck. Uh, like, it's, take a story like Jacob and Esau. You have all these stories in the Old Testament where, I don't know about you guys, but like, I always felt so sympathetic for Esau rather than Jacob. Because it's like Esau just, I know he gives up his birthright and he's supposed to be kind of big, dumb, and hairy. That's probably why I relate to him as I feel big, dumb, and hairy. But like, if you read this text, like everybody sympathizes with Esau. Jacob's not really all that likable. Jacob, you know, he tricks, he lies, he cons, and you know, but he's always the blessed one. Now, I, I, what I realized in preaching about those texts is that people in my congregation, uh, far more of them would identify with Esau more so than Jacob. They don't feel like I'm God's golden child and I can do anything, anything happens, and God's still going to bless me. They feel more like Esau. Really what surprised me, the more I got into some tradition around these texts and how people would grapple with them, that people have always been sympathetic to Esau. We've always felt like those things feel a little bit unfair. Right? Like, how, how does this happen? But he's left out. Why, why is this one favored and this one not? But think about it this way. When God first makes a covenant with Abraham, what he tells him is that I'm going to bless you, I'm going to give you a great name, I'm going to make your family great, and of course the promise, the covenant is, through you... All the families of the earth will be blessed. What if the idea when we're reading those texts is that we're supposed to feel sympathetic for the one who's left out? We're supposed to be rooting for the underdog. We're supposed to, but this seems a little bit unfair because the whole idea that starts with Jacob, but this moves forward and is again fully revealed through Christ Jesus. I know I'm doing a lot of things. I hope this is okay. What if the whole idea, right, is that the, the chosen, are chosen for the sake of the non-chosen. The elect are elect for the sake of the non-elect. Like, but the, what we have revealed to us fully through Christ Jesus is that nobody's left out. The offer, the promise, the blessing is being made available to all of creation. That's where the story is moving. So that by the time we get to Jesus, that's what, that's what our hearts are ready and longing for. Is for the day in which, you know, the gospel isn't just good news for Jacob, it's good news for Esau. It's good news for the prodigal son. It's the offer is good news for the elder son. Am I making any sense at all? Yeah. Yeah. What if Scripture is supposed to shape us in that way? See, I've found people more often than not will be reading texts like that and be like, I must be doing something wrong because I feel sorry for Esau. What if you're supposed to feel sorry for Esau? You know, because ultimately, keep in mind, this is what happens to Jesus, is that Jesus is the one who becomes marginalized and left out on our behalf. He's crucified outside the gates of the city. There's a great text in Hebrews. Precisely so that we can be included. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Well, you know, I'm going to move really quickly now because I want the Q&A to be like central. So just a couple more things. And I know these are big ideas. I just, I'm just really convinced that it becomes so important that first and foremost we're always interpreting Scripture through the life of what's revealed to us about Jesus. And... Um, I will not make Dr. Waddell responsible for this part because, well, he taught me generally about Revelation. You can take credit for this if it's okay with you. If not, you can just completely, this can be like all my fault. But, you know, one of the things that, um, the more and more I start to think differently, and I do think very differently now about Revelation in particular than I did when I was growing up, um, it always felt like for me, right, that the Jesus that's revealed in the Gospels I mean, he's loving, he's kind, he's tender, he's good, all these kinds of things. But Revelation is like dirty, hairy Jesus, who's, who's coming back to, like, you know, heads are going to roll, all that kind of thing. And I know Revelation uses a lot of you know, a violent imagery, a lot of apocalyptic in imagery. But one of the things that, I, that now, I, I, I don't know how I can see this more clearly before, that's so instinctively wrong about that. Like, you know, the, the Jesus, when, when Jesus ascends, what the angels say is that this same Jesus is going to return. You know, it's like, it's not a different story. The idea is not that Jesus tried to redeem us through the cross and resurrection, and it didn't work. So let's go to plan B. Since that cross and resurrection business didn't work, but Jesus is coming back with a sword that's bigger than Caesar's and going to take out the bad guys. And that's not the idea. Out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. That's a statement about the power of the Word of God, which does judge 
But the image is not that Jesus comes back um, and, and is, it is blooding everybody else. But the, the image there in Revelation that's so beautiful is that the, the blood that's spattered on the robe of Jesus is his own blood that comes from his own sacrifice. In other words, it's, it, it's got to be coherent. It's all part of the same story. Revelation gives us an aerial view of exactly what we get in the Gospels and exactly what we get through the letters of Paul. It is that through the death and resurrection of Jesus, love has overcome the violence of the world. Love has overcome the darkness of the world. This is, this is, how, this is how God conquers. This is how the Lamb conquers, is through sacrifice. So I feel like where often that's people will go wrong, though, is that they read... Uh, They'll read texts like in the Gospels, and they'll have a certain understanding of what they think Revelation is saying, and they try to fit what's happening in Revelation. And let me say that. Sorry, conversely, they try to fit the Gospels into the Revelation of Jesus, and that's not the way this is supposed to work. We we interpret it all through what's been revealed to us in the person of Jesus of Nazareth, and like 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 that's the way it has to work first. And it's just I'm just amazed at how many times I've known people who are like super certain about these end time scenarios, but are seem utterly unclear about the direct teachings of Jesus. That's a real problem, you know? So I just think that we always start with this idea that Jesus is the foundation. We interpret everything we know about God through the lens of Jesus. I just think that makes all kinds, uh, all kinds of differences. Um, I want to get your question in just a second. So, what I don't mean to do here is to say that that becomes like this really easy framework to where we don't have to grapple with you know, some of those particular tensions. But I do think that we always need that as a ground floor, is starting with this idea. If Jesus is the ultimate revelation of who God is, what do we already know to be true about Jesus? Where, am I, where can I find Jesus within this text? And even if the text is dark and violent and troubling or disconcerting to me in some way, that to, to pray into that question, how, how, did, how does God reveal Jesus in this? Or in some cases, um, what, what does God want to reveal in me through this text? Is there some kind of darkness in me that the text is trying to illuminate? You know, because that happens sometimes too. Um, I feel like I'm going all over the place. Let's, um, let's transition and do a little bit of q and I've thrown a lot at you in just a few minutes' time. And because it's the end of the day and I've been talking all day, I, I'm not sure my brain is scrambled. So I hope, uh, I just hope something has been, you know, listen to my defaults. I'm starting to say, I hope something in this has been clear. I hope something in this has been unclear. <laughs> so that you might wrestle with it. <laughs> and therefore, um, have some sort of revelation from the Spirit in this way. Um, talk back to me. Tell me what things resonate with you or don't resonate with you. What you struggle with in any of this. Whatever. Do we want to use the microphone so we can have this recorded or something? Or can we just talk up in the middle? I think we can just talk in the middle. Okay, great. I'm sorry, I'll defer. <laughs> Uh, Mike, more for my sake than y'all's. <laughs> yes, there's a mic. Okay. I'll, I'll take the line. Here. Okay, great. <laughs> I'd like that. All right. <laughs> yes, here on the front row. <laughs> Should I wait for the mic? Or no? Yeah, I think we're recording on the recording session. <laughs> yes, <laughs> my hair is dark. Just get there. So, uh, everything you're saying is, is uh, I, I agree with. But I wonder if you would speak to when you're in the process of wrestling, what are some things to keep in mind of how you might wrestle safely yeah. and how you might come out on the other side um, uh, better acquainted with God and how you might not hurt yourself in the process? Right. Oh, that's such a good question. I, you know, I think my first thought would be, um, I think the first thing for me is always not to wrestle alone. <laughs> Because I think, you know, the, uh, the whole model that we get in Acts 15, when the believers are trying to figure out what do we do with these Gentile Christians, because, uh, which is, by the way, such an interesting text, because, you know, and I know you guys, like, I always feel like, I mean, I, I, hope, I, hope, I hope I represent my training in this way. I would want to say anything like you were original, but there's just this really interesting kind of dialectic between uh, the spirit, word, and community there, because you've got, like, so what happens, of course, is... Gentile believers are becoming Christians, and everybody's freaking out because, you know, it would appear on the surface reading the Old Testament like, well, oh, these folks kind of have to be circumcised. But experientially, experience of spirit here is that these folks are, are coming to Jesus, and we are speaking tongues, we're seeing the same kind of manifestations, like this is what we see God doing. But then they get together in community, 
and they have to wrestle with this all together. So there's a corporate process of discernment. You know, say, excuse me, that we can do a small group or you know, among friends on campus, whatever, there's this corporate process of discernment. But then they've got to engage the text themselves. Of course, one of the things that's always really interesting for me about those texts is that when uh, James kind of weighs in to sort of settle the matter, he quotes the Old Testament, this general thing about God being a light to the Gentiles and all the nations. But the scripture he actually uses doesn't have anything to do with circumcision at all. <laughs> and I think if all you had were the text on circumcision uh, that are there in the Old Testament, you may come to a very different conclusion. But like there, there's, there's, there's a dance in that between spirit, word, and community. I think it's like in terms of like safety for me, just always having those pieces in place. Like we're going to take seriously real stories of real people's lives. We're going to be attentive to what God's doing about the spirit in that way. We're going to be attentive to the text itself. We want to, to, to honor the text, let the text say what it says. Uh, not that that's you know, incredibly clear, but we're going to really gauge authentically what the text says. But then we're going to do that with one another. We're going to wrestle in community as opposed to doing that alone. I think so long as we stay within the confines of that spirit word community, that there's a lot of safety in that. It doesn't, of course, mean everything's going to easily be resolved, but I think it, it does provide a safe context where we can wrestle and hopefully not hurt ourselves too badly.